from London, I'm political editor Nicholas Cecil. I'm chief political correspondent Rachel Burford. And I'm deputy political editor Jitendra Joshi. And this is the standard podcast, A Week's A Long Time in Westminster. Recorded from our newsroom at Westminster, this is a series of special episodes every Friday in the run-up to the election. We'll cut through the noise and help you get to grips with what's really going on in politics, both here in London and across the country. Taking you through the week's political news, policy gossip and scandal. And we'll be with you on Results Day to unpack everything. I warn you, don't fall into Labour's trap. Don't sleepwalk to July the 4th. I'm not going to follow the government down the road uh, of unfunded commitments because when you lose control of the economy, it's working people that pay the price. So there really was an unexpected development in the election campaign this week. That's right, Nick, and welcome to the Evening Standard Casino where we're busy placing our bets. Actually, we're not placing bets. That's a terrible idea. As some Tory insiders are now finding to their cost, um, if you happen to know anything uh, about certain events coming up, like exactly when the Prime Minister might be about to call an election. This is really left field, this stuff. Yeah, it's it's been a campaign for Rishi Sunak, uh, one of various missteps, And fair to say, though, that no one quite saw this one coming. And it just feels like they're coming up with ever more interesting ways to blow any chance of recovery in the polls. Mm -hmm. I think what's really amazing about these bets is um, they've not actually won much money. (laughs) It's a small amount. It's not life changing sums. But especially for the police officer who has been suspended over this, it's um, it could be career destroying stuff. Exactly. So. In his or her case, it's pretty serious stuff. So one police officer uh, who is part of uh, the Prime Minister's personal protection unit um, has been arrested and suspended from operational duties as uh, the Met look into um, uh, allegations of suspicious betting activity the day before uh, Rishi Sunak announced the election would take place on July the 4th. If you recall, that was on a very rainy day Um, in Downing Street on May the 22nd. What we're learning now, or what's being reported, is the day before that, various people were placing various bets pointing to a July election, which was contrary to all received opinion at the time. And how has the Prime Minister responded to these, these, this storm blowing up from nowhere? Rishi Sunak says he's very angry. (laughs) And the problem is, his anger is kind of in abeyance pending the outcome of any investigation when other people, the opposition parties especially, are saying, well, you need to crack down on these people. So we know of three conservative figures who who are implicated in this. Two of them are running as as, uh, prospective MPs for the Tory party. One of them is the director of campaigns uh, for the party who's now taken a leave of absence. And this is all over Twitter and other social media, isn't it? And there's more happening on social media in this election campaign. (laughs) Yeah, so uh, it's quite embarrassing for the Tory party. I think there was a well-timed tweet, or not so well-timed tweet, from the Conservative Party that um, had a big sort of video of a roulette wheel and said, if you bet on Labour, you can never win, which came out sort of a couple of hours (laughs) after um, it had come out that another person had been um, implicated in this big betting scandal. They've deleted that now, but it did take them a day, which was quite surprising. I think we're kind of in this sort of era of the cringy political social media post at the moment. There have been a few going around this week, most notably Suella Braverman, who's been using her TikTok account to um, post some campaign videos She's used the uh, the Four Seasons Orlando meme <laughs> um, and done a sort of weird TikTok dance in her constituency as a sort of promote herself. It just seems really odd to me. Like, who are these videos for? Who's going to watch that and think, yep, definitely voting for Suella Braverman I now. mean, can I admit I didn't know about this meme <laughs> beforehand? I don't particularly <laughs> want to know about it either now afterwards. I mean, watch this video. There's nothing in that that's going to say it. To me, anyway, I'm probably the wrong target audience here. But, hey, that looks cool and interesting. I'm going to vote for that person. 
The only one I did like was Dawn Butler's sort of 21 mm. seconds to go uh, cover. She did sort of 21 days to go. I thought that was quite cool. That, I, seemed, that seemed very her, though. I think that was, it was very natural. Exactly. It? It, if you're going to do these things, they have to play into your persona. Mm. They've, they've got to, you've got to lean into it. And if it's going to be bad, it's going to be so wildly bad as to be funny. Yeah. I'm not sure Sue Ella Bradman's quite dancing, made dancing that great. Stairs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if we get away from social media and look at some some number crunching we've had a whole number of polls that this week um some of these new mrp polls which look at very big groups of society and then break it down per constituency so um if we just look at one poll by ipsos they did some figures and in london what was really interesting is that the conservatives could be down to just four mps so they've got around 20 at the moment, and uh, they'd be completely wiped out in inner London. That's never happened before. And if you look at, particularly at the 20 Tory held seats in London, what is happening is that the Conservatives are down a whopping 20 points. Labour is up 12 points. And Reform, Nigel Farage's party, have come from nowhere and are on 10%. So there's this huge squeeze going on on the Tory vote. And it, it means that, that they're losing more than a dozen MPs. And there's one more interesting fact, which is that in these 20 Tory seats, the Lib Dem vote is going down, which suggests there's also tactical voting, which is hitting the Conservative Party. Yeah, I mean, we've got 75 seats in London now. And I mean, the Tory party's um, popularity in the capital has been on the decline for quite a while. But it seems like if these polls are true, it's going to absolutely fall off a cliff on July 4th. Even the four seats that they are predicted to hold on to are really on a knife edge at the moment. But it's not exactly plain sailing either for Labour, is it? So there are some particular issues at play with Jeremy Corbyn and other independents, right? Yeah, there are definitely quite a few sort of high profile independents in the capital. Most notably, obviously, Jeremy Corbyn, Islington North. There was a YouGov poll that was really interesting, actually, that had his seat, that seat there, on too close to call, really. Labour are slightly ahead, according to that poll. They're on 41%, I believe, whereas the independent vote is on 36%. And if you assume that entire independent vote is going to go to Corbyn, that could be a really sort of closely fought campaign in North London there. I think, obviously, Jeremy Corbyn is a big figure locally. He's been an MP for four decades for that area and he was obviously previously leader. It's going to be very tight there. Um, there have been a few interesting things that have happened this week. We know that in the local Labour Party in Islington, Corbyn has had his support. They were quite annoyed, I think, when they put out statements saying they would like him to be the Labour candidate when Keir Starmer um, sort of ousted him totally from the party. Um, this week, though, they're, uh, the chair of the Islington North constituency Labour Party has resigned after she was caught campaigning for um, Corbyn against party rules. Apparently, she attempted to hide in a hedge, but she was seen by multiple witnesses. <laughs> rule, rule number one, when you're, when you're caught red handed doing something, deny, style it out, find some other way to explain it away. But don't, <laughs> don't whatever you do, hide and, in a hedge. <laughs> and say, yes, I was campaigning for him, actually, because I believe in him. Yeah, uh, yeah don't hide behind a bush. <laughs> <laughs> and what's also interesting here about Jeremy Corbyn is Sir Keir Starmer's inability to shake off his legacy, that the Tories are desperately trying to tie Corbyn to Keir Starmer to try and portray the Labour Party as still very much to the left. And... He was on Question Time on Thursday night and um, he was asked, why did you say that Jeremy Corbyn would make a great prime minister? It's clear that Keir Starmer doesn't believe that. And um, the simple answer was, I was in the shadow cabinet. We have cabinet collective responsibility. Therefore, we support the leader. But he keeps on getting flat footed on a number of issues, including on, on Jeremy Corbyn. There are also signs, I think, early signs possibly that the Tories might be starting to ramp up their campaign targeting Keir Starmer personally. So that the decibels might be being just notched up already. Their tax line attack, which is their central line so far, doesn't seem to be working. So they need to find another game changer. So it'll be really interesting to see next week whether their whole campaign gets a lot more personal on Keir Starmer. Just lastly on Corbyn. I think the problem with that attack line from the Tories is it was a long time ago now. 
the last election was in 2019. And um, since then, Keir Starmer has thrown Corbyn out of the party, completely distanced himself from him and um, said he's not allowed back in. So it's a hard one for them to keep going on about, I think. And there's a really strong riposte that they do come back with, which we saw from Keir Starmer last night, which is, well, what about Liz Truss? Every mm-hmm. time they can, they say those two words, Liz Truss, who remains a car-carrying member of the Tory party and, and an officially blessed candidate in South West Norfolk, the contrast is clear. We've dealt with our past. We've dealt with Jeremy Corbyn. He's no longer one of us. Yeah. What about Liz Truss? Well, let's not look back too much at the Liz Truss administration and the chaotic mini budget. Let's um, instead look a, look forward to the second half of this show. And it's not all bad news for the Tories. And guess who's back? Welcome back to A Week's A Long Time in Westminster. So, uh, Rishi Sunak and Conservatives across the country were desperate for some good news this week, and they finally actually got some, and that was that inflation hit the 2% target, which is the Bank of England's 2% target. And what this means is that for more and more people across the country, their wage rises will be outstripping the rise in the cost in the shops and other goods and products. So, the Prime Minister can point to the fall in inflation as having met one of his five key goals. But there's not much more out of these five goals that he can trumpet. So out of five, he's effectively met two of them. One is inflation. The second is getting the economy growing. It might not be roaring ahead, but it is growing. But then if you look at the other ones, NHS waiting lists, still higher than when he made his pledge to cut them. His promise to get the nation's debt falling looks very doubtful. But the biggest one politically is his pledge to stop the boats. And he's completely failing to meet that one. This week, we had a daily record for 2024 of the number of asylum seekers and economic migrants coming across the channel of just under 890 in one day. So on that, all his plans, his Rwanda plan, everything is looking like it's really not working at the moment. You know, Tory voters that may switch to Labour, that small boats issue is really hitting him hard and now the weather is heating up a bit, crossings do increase and we are seeing hundreds and hundreds of people coming over the channel at the moment. And how many people have gone to Rwanda? <laughs> Two. I think, uh, I think voluntarily uh, as well. both voluntarily. Paid. I think far more journalists have gone to Rwanda with the uh, Home Secretary Swella Bravman oh. than people on deportation flights. Well, Far fact, more Home fact, Secretaries well, full stop yeah, have gone to yeah, Rwanda. Yeah, three Home Secretaries is it now have gone over there. You're right, Nick, to, to mention the, the the success on inflation. But even then, there, Rishi Sunak is vulnerable because at the end of the day, this is a headline number. What do people actually feel in their pockets? Mm. And this goes back to the Liz Trust problem. Every time the economy is mentioned, Labour can say, well, OK, but you're still paying massively more for your mortgage, thanks mm. to Liz Trust. Rents have, have shot up, thanks to Liz Trust, because, because of what the mini budget did to rates of borrowing at the time. Those have still got a long way to come back down to levels that people were, were used to uh, prior to then. So, you know, even in strength, there's weakness there. Jamie Hunt, the Chancellor, he's feeling some heat on this. He's he's in a marginal seat in Surrey in, in Godalming and Ash, and um, there'll be lots of people there with, with significant mortgages. And um, he argues that actually the mini budget did not cause long term damage because when he was appointed Chancellor, he quickly reversed many of the measures. But I'm not sure that's what people think out there in the country. That's definitely not what anyone's thinking whose mortgage doubled or tripled. No. Absolutely. And I think it's interesting that even though this is pretty much the only good news that the Tory party have got going on at the moment, you don't see Jeremy Hunt out on the media round all the time, do you? He is very much in his constituency, fighting for every vote there because he really does need them. Yes, one person we did see, perhaps fleetingly, um, make a return to the political front line is Boris Johnson. So he's been doing some campaign videos for Tory candidates in the Red Wall, and, and he's seems to be very much targeting Tory voters who may be considering switching um, to, to reform. So he, he's coming out um, warning, don't vote for Labour because you'll get higher taxes. These are his words, not mine. More wokery. 
more kowtowing to Brussels, and of course, more illegal immigration. Again, his words. It turns out, though, that he's not going to be playing a major role in the campaign. He was on holiday, actually, in Sardinia um, this week. So any hopes by some Boris fans in the Tory party that he's going to return to, to save them, um, that's not going to happen. And even if he were to take on a more high-profile role, uh, the opposition parties have got a one-word reply, Partygate. They will keep hammering away at that if they mm. have to, just as they love to invoke the bogey figure of Liz Truss when it comes to Boris Johnson. It's all about Partygate. Mm. It's all about how Downing Street partied while the rest of the country scrupulously respected lockdown rules at sometimes at great personal cost. You know, is this something that the Tory party really wants to go back to. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, some Tories really cling on to Boris Johnson because he was, at least he was a character. Like he was someone people talked about, someone people loved or loathed. And I think he was almost, I mean, he was kind of a Nigel Farage character in a way. Like he, you know, in the same way that Nigel Farage does inspire people, whether or not he always tells the truth (laughs) is another matter. But Mm. um, he is someone that does at least inspire, you know, talking points and things in politics. And I think that is lacking in some politicians we've got at the moment. Certainly when you mention the name Boris Johnson, often you think of Michael Gove, who obviously famously liked Boris Johnson um, during the, one of the numerous leadership campaigns we've had uh, in recent years. And he made an interesting admission this week. So in the tax debate, the Conservatives are folks trying very, very hard to say, if Labour gets in, your taxes will go up quite a lot, they say. He admitted this week that if the Tories get in, your taxes will also go up. Independent forecasters, economists, they say that basically the tax is on an upward journey. He's admitted it that if the Tories are in power, again, after July 4th, yes, your taxes will continue rising. But he says that if it was Labour, they'd rise by even more. So that was a, a bit of honesty there for Mr. Gove. Well, honesty up to a point because Labour uh, equally would quibble over which party is going to send your taxes up more us or them. The point is, all of this is fantasy economics. All the figures that we're we're seeing bandied about are nonsense. We know that because uh, respected independent adjudicators like the IFS, uh, the Institute for Fiscal Studies, tell us very clearly these figures can't be trusted. Uh, On one side, it's Labour are going to uh, raise your taxes by more than 2,000. That's according to the Tory attack line. For Labour, it's no, the Tories are going to send your mortgages up by more than £4,000. They're really just plucking this out of thin air. So what we do know, the one truism that, the one true point that Michael Gove almost accidentally alighted upon is that taxes are going up because there are massive bills to pay from recent years and it doesn't matter who gets in, we're all going to be uh, exposed to more. Yeah, we're all going to be poor still. (laughs) And I think the other thing to look at is your taxes might be going up but your public services there's still going to be a huge amount of pressure on those so if they're if it's a protected public service like the nhs or if it's for example the defense budget that might go up by a reasonable amount but the public finances are in such a dire strait after the um, covid pandemic and putin's invasion of ukraine and some economic and political mismanagement in recent years But they're in such a dire strait that um, that unprotected departments like police, justice, they could face some some cuts or some very, very limited rises. And this is where we have to pay very close attention to what Labour are saying. Because let's be honest, they're going to be the next government unless the polls are catastrophically wrong. And what's interesting is that both Keir Starmer and Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves have been very studiously ruling some things in, but very not ruling other things out. So they're saying we don't have any plans to do certain things. doesn't mean it's not going to happen or that the manifesto, the Labour manifesto, doesn't call for certain things. But equally, we're not going to write five years of budgets right now. So it's leaving a lot of wiggle room there to, to make some changes further down the line. So it sounds like there's, there's not a great deal of promise of, of jam tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> The Liberal Democrat leader, Ed Davey, was out making jam in um, Sutton this week. Sutton, very key target seats for the uh, the Lib Dems, Carl Sholton and Wallington. And yeah, Ed Davey has been out campaigning there. Um, I went down to see him. 
It was one of the sort of more sedate stunts he's actually done. Um, he was sort of cutting chilies, telling everyone who would listen about his time working in a pork pie factory. Obviously, out on the campaign trail, he's been doing all sorts of things, obstacle courses, paddle boarding, water slides. Um, and I did ask him about this because, I mean, if the polls are correct, he could be quite a big figure in the in the next parliament. At the moment, there's not, if the polls are correct, there's not a 0% chance he could actually be leader of the opposition at this point. And, you know, do we want a water sliding uh, leader of the opposition? I don't know. But um, he defended them and sort of said, actually, you know, look, these stunts do get me press attention and they are raising awareness of things like sewage in our waterways when he did the paddle boarding. Children's mental health was another one that um, he was sort of talking about when I think when he was water sliding. You know, he, sort of, he did defend these stunts and said, yes, they're a bit of fun. And we do like to have a bit of fun on the campaign trail because the other parties are perhaps having a, a tougher time of it. And, and let's be honest, for all the silliness of, of some of the attention-grabbing stunts, uh, he's having a hell of a lot more fun than Rishi Sunak is. Yeah, exactly. Yes, it's um, certainly fun. The <laughs> dynamics are so much better for him that um, he doesn't appear frustrated and tetchy. He's, he's out there just yeah. having a bit of a laugh. I tell you what was interesting as well, walking around, because I did a bit of a walk around um, Sutton and Cheam. There was a lot of Lib Dem signs out there. I used to work in Sutton, so I know the area quite well. And you used to see Tory and Lib Dem signs, you know, every other house would have one or the other on. This time, not a single Conservative sign. And walking around London, you would not see, you don't see Conservative posters out in windows at all anymore. You know, Conservative signs, like, knocked into front gardens. It does feel like there may be people voting Conservative, but they're perhaps not wanting to advertise it quite like they used to. No, I mean, I've been spending time in the southwest, and they're... We're, we're talking Tory constituencies mm. with majorities of over 20,000. There is not a single Tory sign that I've seen passing through those places. Lib Dem signs everywhere. Yeah. Well, at the end of the day, there's only one poll that matters. And um, we'll now know in um, less than two weeks. So um, bring on July the 4th. And that's episode two of A Week's A Long Time in Westminster. Join us here every Friday. For all the latest news, head to standard.co.uk or pick up a newspaper. The Standard Podcast will be back on Monday. Have a great weekend. Listener.